Um, so I'm going to speak, hopefully for less than 30 minutes, about topics that um, I've been thinking about for a while, but having returned to the university context um, just a year ago, actually, I think next week, I'm coming back to reflecting on them as a researcher rather than a practitioner. Um, and particularly, I have taken up a position in a centre that ostensibly studies existential risk. So risks that could um, lead to the existence of the human population. More generally, we say we look at global catastrophe, so things that could lead to significant loss of life for humanity. Um, and many of my researchers, from geologists who look at volcanoes through to philosophers um, that think through our social systems and social resilience, um, think of those things in quite different ways. And one of my jobs is to come in as this centre is a decade old and ask how do we think about these high impact, low probability events, which is what catastrophe is, in more open and different ways, coming from a policy background, coming from a public engagement background, um, as well as some many boring things to do with financial planning and things for the center. So today I really wanna talk about space. Um, and really the space between satellites above our planet and those that live in communities affected by climate change on Earth. Um, and I think of this space, physical as it is, also as a space for negotiating new kinds of thinking about the future, perhaps new kinds of knowledge in preparing for these environmental catastrophes. But I wanted really to start with a justification for why I came to this topic. Um, so the value of this and the, the larger debate around space governance, which you'll hear much more from tomorrow um, from Richard about many of the imaginaries that dominate that discussion of often travel to outer space. And then secondly, talk about some examples that I'm starting to gather of effective interfaces for doing this differently, for thinking about that space between um, our most populated area of outer space, which is our immediate low Earth orbit, and the, the spaces of small communities on Earth. So existential risk scholars, they're a special breed. Um, primarily, this has existed as a kind of sub-discipline. We sit in the School of Arts and Humanities, but you could put us in a political theory, um, political sciences department, many of whom are philosophers, particularly Nick Bostrom, that many of you may have heard of, talk about space colonization as if it is some kind of essential feature of the future of humanity. And I found this kind of weird when I first came to the discipline. And it seems to me that the argument goes a bit like this, and this is Martin Rees, who's founder of the Sun Time Inn, but doesn't have a, um, any direction in its research. His version of this, which is slightly more palatable for me than, than Nick Bostrom and others, which is that they see progress as technological, which I think would be disputed by many people in this room, um, and that as we can't overcome the threats humanity faces on Earth, from climate change to nuclear war, um, this, supposedly this kind of progress will continue. Um, at the same time, we need a kind of plan B, although he, he makes sure he emphasizes it's not the only way the future should go, to use space science to allow humans to explore the solar system and beyond. Um, and the way that I see this argument made, particularly in Nick Bostrom's work, is that progress is technological. This is what Martin agrees with. If we continue that, the, national, the natural progression of that is technology to take us off the planet. And if you pair this with a view that progress is a good thing or this kind of progress is a good thing, then you should be more concerned about ensuring um, the welfare of prosperity, perhaps, of future generations and our generation today. So there's what Will McCaskill, who's another philosopher from Oxford as well as Nick Bostrom, calls like the strong long-termist argument where they, they want to only focus on these future generations, which I found kind of mind boggling. I don't agree with, but I'm still learning why I don't agree with it <laughs> since coming into this field. Um, and there are subtleties here. So quite often that group of people, those, that group of mm, Will McCaskill's my age, older white men um, <laughs> get put together. And actually I think there are some interesting differences. So recently Will took to Twitter as they like to do if they're not buying the company. Um, to talk about the difference between his and Elon Musk and other great space colonizers, ideas of, of why we go off planet. Um, and Will says here that he disagrees that near-term space settlement is a top priority. He doesn't think this is the only way to think about the future of humanity. 
Um, he thinks there are many other threats that we should also be dealing with and we shouldn't kind of leave Earth as a plan B. Um, and I think that's, I don't really agree with either of them, but I think that's an important um, to note that these are not one group of opposites to where I'm sitting at the moment, but they actually have some differences in their own opinions. And so this is, this is how I write out that argument. Um, I'm going to read it from here. <laughs> uh, so they tend to say that progress is about exploiting resources. Clearly, we would argue with that. Many people here have very good reasons to. I think our planet has just simply demonstrated that to us, um, that exploitation has consequences such as pollution, et cetera, that we haven't dealt with, and therefore that form of progress has very clear limitations. But even if you accept some thesis that humanity progresses over time, um, through this kind of technological development. There's so much evidence that we've not yet, the governance mechanisms, the mindsets, the virtues, as um, Keith Abney, who wrote, uh, was the sorry co-editor of a special issue of Futures on the great space um, colonization debate puts, he talks in terms of virtue ethics about this, or even the governance mechanisms, even if we have the mindset, that would lead to us moving off Earth successfully. Like that, that is the fundamental thing. Even if you believe this thesis, we don't seem to have, there's no evidence that we're very good at managing living sustainably on Earth. So why on Earth would we manage it on another planet? I think this is the bit of the argument that even if I can never convince those philosophers of my point of view, I can at least say that this is true, that our weak governance systems on Earth will not suddenly become strong governance systems off Earth. And in fact, um, Phil Torres and others um, have said, you know, many of the human characteristics that come through when we are starting new groupings, new societies in an environment that is resource constrained are not associated with human flourishing, human success, human um, society being, being a nice place to be and actually a better, you know, an off world population that is suffering may not be a better thing than, than a smaller number of people on earth, which is directly in in contravening uh, Nick Bostrom's future imaginary, which is the 10 to the 48 million people, 10 to the 48 people, sorry, living off world in a thousand years time. Um, and I think the, this song from Super Furry Animals, which is a Welsh band to be clear, so they, they are concerned about colonization because they don't like the fact that they're part of the UK um, and often associated with England, um, or some of them don't, um, includes this line around colonizing the moon will take all the bad ideas, all the market leaders, all the hopes and none of the fears, all the bad equations, all the warring factions, and they'll fight it out, they'll fight until extinction. Implying that as we move to the moon, and I think this is the essence of what my argument is, is that there's no reason why we wouldn't just reflect those warring factions, those problems with globalization, those problems with unsustainable living that we have on Earth. Um, and there's a link there to a really nice 2016 version if you want to listen afterwards. So the, um, how this relates to an area of governance I have worked in. Um, so the 1960s agreement for the peaceful use of outer space is really important. It led to Cold War era lack of weapons in space. And that's hugely important. And I, you know, kudos to the lawyers that drew that up. And well done to the states that kept to it. Um, I think it's a great piece of le international legislation and, and one reason to be proud of the UN. However, it's had its time. Those forms of governance have had their time. And I think that for me became um, the kind of absurd end to what was a useful practice came recently with these new guidelines for the long-term sustainable use of outer space. Having discussed the, um, the fact that we have too many satellites in low Earth orbit, at some point it might get almost impossible to get anything out of this planet because there's so many satellites there and they keep bumping into each other or being exploded by their own countries, China, Russia, etc. cetera. Um, it was still the discussion that led to this, these new guidelines started with the idea that bringing a group of a small number of states together, 15, 20, primarily from developed countries, sitting them in a room like this for three days with a bunch of lawyers and writing some guidelines and publishing the PDF is international governance. And I just don't think that's right, especially when space, it is literally the thing that surrounds us all. So why do a small number of people that live in a very small number of geographies get to decide it and write it in this kind of 20th century governance document? 
And it's particularly sad if you go to big space events, there's so much energy. There's 70 nations now with spacefaring abilities. Most of them, 80% of them, it's by some calculation, although 70, anyway, 80% of 70 is not 15, but whatever. Um, <laughs> 20% is not 15. Um, but they don't get to participate in these discussions. They get to be part of running space programs that copycat. So the Malaysian space program is an absolute copycat of how NASA evolved. You kind of sort of year by year, the planning is to be like NASA was in this year and this year. There's very little ownership of what they want their nation to be in space and how space matters to what their agenda is as a country. And it still gets dominated by these kinds of discussions. And I think... Um, the kind of cultural absurd version of this is Elon Musk wearing an Occupy Mars t-shirt, which I'm sure Richard can tell you much more about than me, but it just makes me laugh every time. This is Elon with um, Robert Zubrin, who's a member of the Mars Society, a US libertarian who believes that we have a moral obligation um, to make the world more suitable, other worlds more suitable for Earth life um, as a natural process of life transforming its surroundings to suit its needs. And that just that phrase that they use, natural process of life, of humans transforming their surroundings, I just can't get my head around. But also Occupy Mars. You know, the Occupy movement was an oppositional movement. It said, don't, like, I don't like Wall Street. This metaphor for capitalism doesn't work. I want to pull it down and I'm gonna stand in front of it to try and pull it down. I don't really know who Elon is rebelling against here. Is it the microbes that he wants to pull down their way of life on Mars? Like the, the, the narrative of this stuff is bizarre. And I just, I can't, I haven't fully comprehended why there's this sense that someone has, I don't know what it is, a, a self savior concept. We'll hear more from you about the imaginaries around this tomorrow. Um, but it does worry me because many people say to open up the governance of space, we should invite the companies to the table. And Elon is also the founder of SpaceX, one of those companies. I don't think this gets us to a broader group around the table. And finally, I think the, the most absurd thing is the placement of large space-looking devices, particularly telescopes, in communities that we are also colonizing. And this US example, where is Mount Graham? I was gonna ask you. Yeah, it's just past the Yeah, okay. So in 1992, on the 500th anniversary of Christopher Columbus arriving in the Americas, 200 people stormed the um, construction site of the Stewart Observatory to protest the building of the large binocular telescope, which was originally called the Columbus Telescope, which was being built on Mount Graham. Many of these groups were um, groups, indigenous groups that lived on that land. And this image of these people storming their own land to take back the colonizers viewing space from it sticks with me um, every time I think about this. The, um, the idea that they are not deciding who looks to space for them, but someone else has supplanted on their space the ability to look into outer space is just crazy. Um, and I, you know, we're not going to change it now. But, but it's, it's a pretty sad story of, of some of those stories we hear in, in Southern America, Southern US. So there are movements against this. Um, Daniela Wood, who is employed by NASA part-time, she is an engineer at MIT, but she also runs a lot of work around an anti-colonial mindset in Earth. And she has a great post, it's just a blog post from 2020. Her, a lot of her work in this area around governance is not published in journals. For her journals are for her engineering work and governance is the thing you do on the side. Um, take from that what you will. Um, but she, she has a list of five things she th thinks should be done. Um, and I just wanted to quote two of them. So moving to this anti-colonial mindset means divine, define sustainability to include economic, social and environmental balance building on the model of the sustainable development goals for Earth. So she wants to see sustainable development goals for locations in space. And it's a very obvious call to say, if we are learning the lessons from growing sustainably on our own planet, we should do so in space as well. And the second one I wanted to draw attention to was that she was very, uh, there's to come to the kind of mindset shift or different ways of seeing things or a different metaphor for how we get to space. I think it's important how she refers to um, the perspective of indigenous peoples, as I probably say, um, that have experienced colonization 
to listen to them, to think about alternative ways of conceiving of shared property so that we do not repeat those exercises in taking their property or taking their land or taking their ways of thinking that we have done in the past. However, we're not, <laughs> our sustainable development goals haven't necessarily achieved what we want on earth. We've still got a lot to learn here. So I think I sit more with Andrea O, oh, who's a, um, a European researcher, um, who again wrote this in a, a blog post, which is why I'm, I'm quoting it directly here. Weirdly on the United, um, essentially a defense think tank in the UK, this was written on, um, Rissi. Um, but she points out that, you know, if we have not really got to the issue of how resources um, are used on Earth and we're still polluting and destructing our, destroying our planet, then how on Earth should we, why, why should we be taking those behaviours off planet? We need to focus here first, clean our backyard first before we move elsewhere. And similarly, she points to the idea, the flawed idea that humans are superior and separate from nature, something that we heard about earlier, that actually there's more than just cleaning up our practices, our mechanisms, our ways of working, but also changing our mindsets and our metaphors for how we think of um, our work on a planet with nature before we move off planet. And I think both of those are still important elsewhere. So there have been several attempts to ensure that things like the Sustainable Development Goals and that ethos sits behind space exploration. And in my case, I'm going to talk about low Earth orbit satellites because that's what I know about and that's the kind of policy discussion I've been involved in. It, it, it's all about going to the moon, about International Space Station. I'm sure you can make parallel arguments there. Um, so, for example, in the US, SEVER, which is a NASA program, NASA, this shares very detailed um, global data with countries and other kinds of governance organizations. I don't know what they mean by that, but I think they mean global agencies of the UN, Red Cross, etc. cetera, um, with those. Um, so NASA will share that data for free. Um, and that was important even this year. You can see in 8th of May, this is the, um, so the Hindu Kush Himalayas um, before we had, we started moving towards floods, floods that really affected Pakistan in the last month. So on the 8th of May, and then the same area on the 22nd of July. And so this is, you know, for Sefer, this is a good case study of how they've worked with agencies in the region to support change. Um, and I think this is important. This is, um, instead of NASA is, um, holding onto that data, selling that data, making it about a US story of, of winning at space, they're actually sharing it for free um, supporting not just sustainable development, but crisis response. Um, and I think one of the reasons I, that's not the end of the story though, is that this also needs to kind of come in combination with local decision making. So I think I would feel more uncomfortable if NASA then went made a decision about where crisis response is used in the, the Hindu Kish Himalayas. But actually there are many centers, particularly the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, which is in Nepal, um, which helps with a lot of the future thinking around catastrophe response in that region. And so it takes that decision making to the local level. So even if they're using American data and you can kind of say there's a kind of US imperialist data complex, you, you can, um, the decision making is local. Um, and in particular, they develop a set of 2080 um, scenarios for their own region, um, thinking how things could go wrong. The downhill version of that um, really looks at how local communities are changing um, without support to develop their own food, energy, or water security, as well as maintaining local culture, which is a bit of a dismal scenario, but it's then allowed them to put things in place today to try and avoid it. Um, and where that hasn't worked as well is that the NASA program um, in their relationships with the Amazon has taken a more colonial approach perhaps by sending in their own US people to advise local governments. Um, and I think I'm much less comfortable with this. I'm much more comfortable with organizations from a particular region owning that governance because it feels like they can own it for longer, not just a single exercise. But actually, um, I was doing some other research and I was speaking to Emiliano, who's a researcher in the Amazon. He's, 
He spent 15 years searching for panthers in the Amazon, 19 years maybe, often by himself. So he's he's an interesting character. Um, And he now has a sustainable development institute in the the Brazilian um, part of the Amazon rainforest. Um, And he told me a story about how scientific data on the Amazon is, is useful, but it hasn't, in some cases, it hasn't been the best way to understand a phenomenon there. And in many cases, the combination of that with local knowledge is the strongest way to develop a um, policy response. And in particular, the piracu fish, um, it's an endangered air breathing fish, and it comes up about once every 20 minutes to breathe. So fishermen in the Amazon, particularly the Brazilian um, Amazon basin, are really good at knowing how many piracu are in a certain area because they've got their eye in over years, <laughs> saying, well, if they come up about every 20 minutes and I've seen 15 in the last seven, you know, they can do these estimates in their heads really well. And there was an intervention um, from a, I can't remember where the university is from, but certainly a European university, to create a scientific technique using cameras and algorithms to try and count the number of fish, to try and support sustainable fishing mechanisms locally. It wasn't particularly uh, good. I mean, it was just really expensive. And they found out that the local fisherman version was 98% as efficient as in 20 years, very expensive. It's like a 20 million euro project that came in. And more importantly, since the fish counting technique by these um, fishermen has been elevated because it's been rewarded with citations in scientific journals and and such like, it has become allowed in the official local scientific policy discussions. And that has meant actually those fishermen have become the ambassadors for more sustainable fishing policies and have much more of an effect in their region than when similar scientific techniques have been used elsewhere. There are now um, four times as many fish um, in 10 years in that region, um, which is 330,000. And that includes these communities are quite small. So over 400 communities are embedding and using that policy, which is why I guess you can see the local fishermen being ambassadors for it is more important. So um, I might not go through all of these examples. I just, the thing that this taught me, although it's not about space data, it was a lesson for how conscious and very careful combination of scientific data with local knowledge can really take us much further. And we're not doing that in space. You can share NASA satellite pictures. Copernicus does the same in Europe. But that's an openness of data. It doesn't give you the power to make good local decisions. And in fact, disempowers people when you feel like you're the kind of person that can't interpret that data. Anyone can access the virtual observatory of outer space. You know, it's a source for astronomers around the world. Um, But I don't know what to do with that data. Um, but I do know um, the river system that, that regularly floods in my, in my back garden just between Cambridge and, and London. And I think starting from these local seeds is of ideas and combining them with global data is just something we're really bad at. Um, in, in some of my futures and foresight work that I've been part of, you know, you talk about local engagement. But when I decide to hand over power to someone else, to get them to draw a picture of what the future of their school looks like versus when I take the power back and decide that I'm the expert in a method that can then decide critical uncertainties and how this becomes future. That's a little bit arbitrary and has come from the history of futures methods. It's not not saying that that's the best time to have the best interaction with that co-developer of this idea. Um, And so I'll move on to a couple of examples where I've been involved in people trying to do this differently. Um, So in response to COVID, I worked with the World Health Organization in 2020 um, in the Asian Pacific region, so out of their Filipino headquarters, working with countries from the Cook Islands um, to Thailand. And we held some very, very short sprints with experts from around those countries in how you could embed long-term thinking into the fast, short-term response to COVID. So how you could suddenly have conversations about a long-term transition to universal health care, which had got stuck 
because the opportunity of this short-term crisis allowed you to have those long-term conversations. So we brought longer-term futures, creative thinking <laughs> in some cases, trying to think differently about an area where there'd been impasse before into a short-term response. And I, I think that wasn't a perfect exercise. It was primarily people who spoke English who could find the hour a day we were asking for them for, for two weeks during the COVID <laughs> response. And it was primarily academics and people from local gov from government in those countries. Um, but it certainly felt better than many of the future of healthcare exercises I've been involved in in the past. And it was certainly closer to the policymaker. We were working directly with WHO and the results were shared at WHO's um, annual general assembly. Um, so I think that kind of work I'd love to do more of. Uh, secondly, <laughs> have I run out? No, not quite. Um, this was at Expo 2020, which you all now know about. <laughs> uh, so having been in Dubai for three years, from 2016 to 19, as some kind of, uh, I was nominally head of research at the Dubai Future Foundation, but really meant asking difficult questions in conversations about what the, the foundation did and primarily focusing on um, data policy, privacy, many of the things that are common to our discussions of governance in Europe that were less common um, in smaller, younger states. Um, and I went back for Expo because I was asked to help run this program called the World Magilis. Um, and this was, the idea was that this was a talking space in and around um, Expo's theme weeks, but themes like health, cities, like kind of random things that can mean lots of things. Um, but they were 10 weeks during the sixth month of Expo 2020. And we were quite proud, they were quite proud of this scheme because it was an open conversation that was live streamed, which is a rare thing in that part of the world. It had representatives from many of the 192 countries that were part of Expo talking about particular hot button issues, essentially without censorship. Um, but actually the thing that I was most proud of is that in these hour and a half conversations, we, we, there were no presentations, no one spoke like I'm speaking now. Um, and what that meant that was about 45 minutes in, people just started to talk more freely and they would start to come up with ideas on stage. They would start to see something in what someone else said or hear something in what someone else said and build on it properly rather than just with what they would always say anyway. And particularly in those conversations, although they were in English, which is a, you know, was a real barrier for some of the states. Um, some of those conversations between countries that didn't normally come across each other. So the Malaysian and Portuguese space agencies speaking to each other in Space Week, for example, was unusual. They realized they had similarities or they saw new ideas that they want to work on afterwards. And I, I think, you know, this kind of making the space and time for insight and not just repetition of our well-worn ideas is, is a, is, doesn't happen at a UN forum normally. It's about coming and, and lobbying with a preformed agenda. But if we could start to get there in the UAE at an expo, I think more formal governance context could probably get there. Um, finally, I'm gonna talk quickly about Shared Studios, um, which is Brendan Federer's work. His PhD, um, this is a quote from, he worked at Shared Studios. These are shipping container portals, and most famously, there was one in the UN headquarters in New York, and the other half of it. So you're in your shipping container, and there's a screen, and the screen is a portal to the other container. Um, and that's been in Afghanistan, it's been in Iraq, it's been in Yemen, um, it's been in lots of other places. And you have a relaxed conversation in that forum. And I think, again, for me, what I loved about Shared Studios and what Brendan describes as um, the feeling of being in the same room, the atmospheric interface as opposed to transactional interface, um, effective in that in the, it connected you with, with feelings and not just um, logic, um, was really important. The fact that people in those locations would have a dinner party together sometimes, they wouldn't be there because they needed to achieve a particular policy goal. And you got different kinds of consequences from those interactions. And I'd love to see more of those injected into those high level policy forums. Um, sometimes we forget that we're all human and that we want that time to be creative and think differently, even when we're in the most formal um, um, settings. Um, yeah, and the final thing I'll say is that there are people doing this well. So my colleague Lauren Holt at Cambridge did some beautiful work where 
She works a lot on the intrinsic value of nature, um, and we had a national review of natural capital led by the economist Partha Dasgupta in the UK. Lauren created a podcast for the civil servants working on this review to talk about the that, that is a discussion about the intrinsic value of nature positioned within a review that by calling itself a review of natural capital clearly doesn't really think much of the intrinsic value of, of nature. It thinks much more of it, nature as capital. And this podcast was listened to these civil servants on the way home from their work. So she was not trying to directly, although she has done in the media, um, pull apart this review, but actually intervene in its practice by talking to the civil servants themselves. And I will end there because it finished. <laughs> Thank you.